Before viewing video lessons, it is important to read the textbook using the learning guide as your turn-by-turn -turn directions. Then use the learning guide to take organized notes in your own words with examples and pictures. This video will begin personality in chapter 11 of your textbook. Study, the study of personality will incorporate many aspects of the biopsychosocial model. Personality itself is considered more of a psychological construct because it is made up of behaviors, thoughts, and emotions. But as you will learn over the course of this unit, it also includes biological and socio-environmental factors. To truly understand personality um, takes understanding the answers to certain questions. These are questions that you probably ask yourself on a regular basis. You know, why are people like that? Why do people do what they do? Um, probably over the course of any given day, you ask yourself that, that type of question inside your head many times. We also often wonder about ourselves. How did I get to be who I am? Or how can I change who I am? If we can answer these questions, if we can understand personality, then we will be able to answer the most basic fundamental questions about psychology. This video focuses on the nature of personality. So in psychology, personality is going to be defined by the parts of you that are stable or consistent across situations and time. What that means is that who you were yesterday is going to be who you are tomorrow, and how you act in one situation is going to be similar to how you act in different situations. Personality is also about what is unique or distinctive about you. It's like your fingerprints. Nobody has the exact same fingerprint. Nobody has the exact same personality as you. And nobody will ever have the exact same personality as you. So it's the part of you that's stable and consistent, but also distinctive across situations and time. The core of personality is really about patterns of behavior. And for psychologists, we're going to talk about patterns of behavior. When we talk about behavior, we're going to talk about thoughts, how you are perceiving the world, what you're saying to yourself inside your head about your experiences, but also your emotional experiences. We tend to have kind of emotional patterns of interacting with our world and reacting to it. And then finally, actions or those kind of observable behaviors. So if you put all of this together, personality is really about consistent and distinctive patterns. Now, typically, we will describe personality in terms of something called a trait. Psychologists like to use the term durable disposition. This has to do with your tendency to behave in a particular way in a variety of situations. So now that we have uh, defined what personality is according to psychologists, we want to examine the major theories about personality. Now these theories are kind of in two different groups. One group consists of theories that we've already talked about in this class. So we're, it's going to be the psychodynamic. We talked about that in the evolution of psychology unit. The behavioral theories. We talked about that in the evolution of psychology unit, but also again in our last chapter on learning. It also has to do with the humanistic perspective. We were introduced to that in the evolution of psychology chapter. And then finally, the biological perspectives, um, which were introduced in the evolution of psychology unit, but we've talked about those very heavily, particularly with the chapter on the biological basis of behavior. So those four theories all are related to um, how we got the personality we have, where it came from, and how changeable it is. The other uh, major theory of personality, that's the five-factor or trait theory, 
is going to look at personality from a completely different perspective. So if you remember in the research uh, chapter, we talked about the goals of science. And one of the first goals of science is simply to be able to measure and describe. The five-factor trait theory is all about measuring and describing our personality. So we're going to start with the five-factor, and then in other videos we will talk about the other four perspectives. So the five-factor model was created by actually several research teams, but one of the most well-known is a te the team of Costa and McRae. And they took um, someone else's research instrument that had thousands of different personality traits listed. And these personality traits were part of a test that was given to thousands of different people. So these thousands of different people answered questions about their personality traits. Things that were related to observable behaviors like when I'm at a party I like to sit in the corner by myself. That would be a behavioral trait. Could be an emotional trait uh, like I tend to worry a lot. That would be more of an emotional trait. Um, and then also some cognitive or thought-based traits. Things like, I believe other people are generally good. Those would be examples of the different types of questions. So what Costa and McRae did with all of this data, which was the answers to thousands of questions by thousands of different people, is they did some fancy mathematics. It's a, a particular type of math called statistics. And within statistics, there is a special procedure called factor analysis. It's kind of a super fancy correlational procedure. And we talked about those in the, the research chapter. So basically what factor analysis does is it looks at every individual question on these thousands of personality trait questions and looks to see for people who answered question three a certain way, um, did they answer any other questions in similar ways? And so it looks for correlations between the answers to every individual question to every other individual question. And through that mathematical procedure, um, what they identified were five factors or five sets of questions about personality traits that kind of lumped together. They were, they were connected to each other and related to one another in this factor analysis procedure. And then they looked at what those items had to do with, what kinds of things those items were asking about. And they tried to give them sort of some names or labels that made sense based on what the questions were about. And what they came up with were five factors. You can use the OCEAN acronym to help you remember these. But it was openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And so that's when they looked at the items, that's what they called those five factors. <clears throat> so we're going to take just a brief moment to talk about what highs and lows on each one of these factors might mean. There's also a discussion board that allows you to kind of explore these a little bit more and come up with some examples. So the important thing to note about the five-factor model is that every person has some degree of each one of these personality traits. So every one of us has some degree of agreeableness. Some people are highly agreeable, some people are highly disagreeable, and then there's a lot of people kind of in the middle on agreeableness. So on each of these five traits, every person will exist somewhere on the continuum. One of your report options in this class involves uh, taking a personality test that actually gives you your five-factor personality trait. So let's get started in looking at each one of the traits. We're going to start with openness to experience. So someone who is high on openness to experience is somebody who is imaginative and curious. They're artistic. They're unconventional. 
They're a very flexible kind of person. Somebody who's low on this particular trait is kind of the opposite of that. They're rigid, down to earth, not artistic, not creative, not curious, and tend to be very conventional. Okay, our next trait is going to be conscientiousness. Someone who's high on conscientiousness or constraint, they're going to be disciplined and organized, punctual, diligent, dependable. Um, they are going to be the type of person that likes to follow rules. And interestingly, this particular trait has been shown to get higher in people as they go through their college career. So they've actually tested college students when they first started college and then tested them when they finished. And what they found is that um, college students became more conscientious over the course of a four-year degree. Now that doesn't mean somebody who was low will somebody suddenly become high, but people kind of got nudged more in the high direction through that college experience. Low conscientiousness, again, that's going to be kind of the opposite. So they're undisciplined, undependable, careless, disorganized, late. Um, this is the friend you have that you have to tell them to be there a half an hour before everyone else just to get them to show up on time. Okay, our next trait is going to be extroversion, also uh, known as positive emotionality. So what we see with this one is that people tend to be very friendly, gregarious, upbeat, outgoing, sociable, and assertive. This is the person who, in a group of strangers, will introduce themselves to everyone and, and start the conversation going. Somebody who's low on extroversion isn't unhappy but they uh, tend not to display a lot of external positive emotions. So they tend to be less sociable, more reserved and quiet and withdrawn. That doesn't necessarily mean unhappy. Um, and they also tend to be a little bit more passive, a little bit more kind of unlikely to rock the boat. The next trait is agreeableness. Um, people who are highly agreeable are very cooperative, sympathetic, trusting. Uh, super high are trusting to a fault, so they may be a little bit gullible. They tend to be modest and very straightforward kinds of people. Someone who is uh, low on agreeableness is going to be the opposite. They're going to be critical irritable, arrogant, suspicious, some, sometimes even to the point of being kind of ruthless about other people. Okay, the next trait is neuroticism, also sometimes referred to as negative emotionality. And people who are highly neurotic tend to be self-conscious and anxious, insecure, vulnerable, and sometimes hostile. So this is where those kind of unhappy or negative emotions would come into play. Now the opposite of this is not necessarily happy, but more a lack of anxiety or hostility. So people who are low on neuroticism tend to be calm. They tend to be um, unemotional or at least not overly emotional. They would be described as even-tempered, uh, comfortable, and unshakable. They would be kind of hard to rattle because they're so even and steady. So those are the five factors in the five-factor model of personality. And this is a model that is got a lot of agreement in psychology in terms of being a good way to accurately describe people's personality. It doesn't, however, try to explain why you have that personality and how you might change it.